Professor, when I spoke to you recently, you said that your topic you'd like to talk about was why I came to Imperial College, but what I did when I got here. Oh, yes, indeed. Well, I came, I thought, to make vehicles travel across the ground at 300 miles an hour. In 1964, this seemed a real possibility in Britain before the end of the 60s. Linear motors was my topic. It was from my research on linear motors that I got the appointment. And that's the way it seemed to be going. But in the 1970s, it took all manner of turns for all manner of reasons. I went from one subject to another, sometimes returning back to electromagnetism and linear motors. Companies were set up. I got involved in all sorts of things I would never have dreamed of before I came here. But it emphasized that my decision was right and that the reason I was appointed was right. I can remember the interview I had with the late Sir Patrick Linstead. It was the only interview I had to get the job. And his $64 question was, would I rather be a member of a large team of professors, such as you got at Imperial College, or, as he put it, boss of the whole shooting match at a provincial university. And I knew that this was the $64 question. I better answer very carefully. So I'd answered him with another question. And I said, well, Rector, it's always been my ambition to push forward the frontiers of knowledge in my subject. And I think if frontiers are going to be pushed forward anywhere, it's going to be here, isn't it, Imperial College? and a broad grin on his face told me that I'd got the job. Well, yes, I, I think I've pushed a few frontiers along myself, but I've also been much encouraged by the people that I've come across since I've been here who've pushed frontiers a lot further. Well, one of the people that, of course, you, you, you got to know quite well while he was still alive was Sir Willis Jackson. Ah, my connections with Sir Willis went back a very long way. In 19... 46, I got a Class B release from the RAF to come and start being an undergraduate at the ripe old age of 25. And I went to Manchester University and I went to see the Professor of Electrotechnics, as it was called, and there I met a Professor Willis Jackson. And he accepted me as a student. That was the beginning. The same year that I took up my studentship, he left the chair at Manchester and came to Imperial College to take a chair here. F.C. Williams replaced him at Manchester. But Willis had not been long here, or so it seemed, before he came back to Manchester as Director of Education and Research with a seat on the board of Metropolitan Vicars, as it was then. In that position, he sent for me and asked me if I would be a consultant to Metropolitan Vicars and would I keep an eye on the research department there for him. It was there he received his knighthood. He then returned to Imperial College to be a sort of super professor, two ranks above an ordinary professor, known to the boys in, in the grapevine of academic life throughout the country as God. It was said at the time that there were chairs, armchairs, thrones and God. This was said by a roommate of mine in Manchester, not realising that I was about to get myself a throne. It's all very amusing. But then, of course, he was made Lord Jackson of Burnley, and he welcomed me here. He got me here single-handed. <coughs> I think he more or less told Sir Patrick and said what, uh, that he had to take me. Because when he introduced me in my inaugural lecture, I shall always remember his words. He said, a few years ago, I met a bright young man in Manchester, and I thought to myself, one day I'll have young Lathwaite come and work for me. And here he is to give his inaugural lecture, and the, the, the audience sort of rose to him because he was saying, I did it single-handed, which he did. He also said to me the first week I came that I was to remember it was all good fun if I kept my sense of humour. I think I still have my sense of humour, but sometimes it's been very difficult. I felt like a stranger in London for the first ten years, I think, even though I brought an ex-colleague, Fred Easton, with me. Uh, one's not readily accepted at Imperial College, I think. And Willis asked me once to give him a summing up of the department. And I put it aside several times because I didn't really want to tell him. 
And eventually he insisted, got rather sort of cross about it. So I said, well, as one Lancastrian to another, I could sum up this department by saying it was run on fear. And I didn't have to tell him who they were afraid of. And at this he got really angry, but only for about 60 seconds. And then he stopped and said, yes, well, I did ask. I said, yes, you did ask. But the fear came not from Willis himself. It came from the intermediary. It came from the person you had to get past to get to Willis. It came from his secretary, who was a retired naval officer and couldn't forget it. And if Willis said that he wanted to see Eric Laithwaite um, about some trivial matter, then his secretary forgot to tell me what he wanted to see me about. And all that came down was, Sir Willis would like to see you in his office on October 13th at 3.30 p.m. And he thought, oh, hell, I'm going to be sent to Siberia. If you felt that you might have done something wrong, you see. When, in fact, all he wanted to ask you is, uh, did you, could you get him a reprint of a page of a book? You see, I mean, um, it was obvious where the fear was coming from. But people here do tend to look over their shoulders. I found there are three kinds of person on the staff at Imperial College. There are the great distinguished men, like Nobel Prize winners, of which there were three when I came here, and there are still three, although the original three all died. Thirty-odd professors of the Royal Society, and they're here to decorate the place and to make sure that they get the very best staff and research students, which they do. Then there are young men who come as lecturers or senior lecturers, on the grounds they've come here for two years so they can better themselves. They come and they go, they pass through, and they're brilliant, and we're fortunate to have them for as long as they stay. And then there are the administrative staff who take on all the chores that make life bearable for a professor like myself. They are the solid blocks on which the, the whole setup stands. But research, no, they don't bother about research. And they disappear at the end of June and reappear on the 1st of October. And thus getting us, I suppose, all into trouble because neighbours and friends tend to say about August when you're really sweating your guts out, oh, I suppose you're on your very long holiday now. And this always annoys me. <laughs> there it is. Someone else, of course, that you knew quite well while, uh, while, once again, he was still alive, was Professor Dennis Gabor. Yes, indeed. Um, I shall be delighted to tell my grandchildren that Dennis was a colleague. Mine, worked in the same department. Dennis was always very kind to me. He said in public once that the ideas that I had belonged to the next century rather than to this one. And I think he meant it sincerely. I didn't understand holography when I first came here. And I asked one of the boys who'd worked with Dennis, you know, would he explain it to me? Looking over his shoulder first left and right, he, he said um, he'd never known so I said, but God, man, you worked with him. He said, I, I never dared ask him. I said, that is exactly the situation that I'm in. <laughs> because I wouldn't want Dennis's opinion of me to go down. Um, Willis's words about him, I think, were that some people didn't tolerate fools gladly. Dennis didn't tolerate anybody gladly. He couldn't get anyone to work for him. He worked alone. I mean, if they didn't please him, he called them fools, don'ts and idiots, and, and they would run away and not come back. And... Sometimes uh, I think I might be going that way because there are people now that won't work with me. And my wife says I must terrify people. I don't feel as if I do. The thing is I get over carried away with enthusiasm and I tend to start shouting and waving my arms about and getting really excited because if I didn't, I, you know, I wouldn't do anything useful. And it can be misinterpreted, I know. But um, I hope I don't terrorise people. I mean, Dennis didn't really. Um, I remember the first day I went to my first heads of section meeting. And Dennis came in last with Sir Willis. And Sir Willis said to me, Now, Eric, you see what sort of reprobates you've got yourself landed with as colleagues. Whereupon immediately Dennis said, Splendid fellows, Willis, all of them, splendid fellows. Dennis was from mid-European extraction. He could have come straight from Transylvania because um, he had the accent. He had a magnificent pair of eyebrows that he used to flash up and down. 
And in his obituary, someone who knew him well said that his determination to master English idiom, together with his trouble with the language and his abundant use of his massive eyebrows, may, made him an obvious target for caricature and for imitation. And uh, it, he said it is, it is recorded that he once destroyed a senior lecturer in brackets now a learned professor, and I must confess I'd love to know who it was, by saying, by Dennis saying to him, come in, sit down, my boy. Now let me see you give your impersonation of me. <laughs> it's enough to destroy anybody. Dennis was a great character. At his memorial service that I was honoured to attend, the address given by Dr. Alibone, who smuggled him out of Europe in 1938, thereabouts, said, Dennis was never a good administrator. What a blessing for the world! And this amused me, considering that all the administrators of the college were sitting in a row in the front pew. <laughs> there it was. Now, De Dennis is a rare breed. They come very seldom. Now, of course, you've, you've been in, involved in many films for schools and television, BBC. Um, recently, you were telling me, telling me about a rather interesting incident with Milbank films where you were trying to uh, float your sphere. Yes, um, people come to me, not only people making films and the like, lots of people come wanting to know the impossible. Um, I was reminded of a story of an angler who got up early one morning to go and fish for, for salmon. And he was whipping the water with his line from about 6 a.m. By about 9 o'clock in the morning, he hadn't had a single encouragement of any kind, nothing to show for his three hours of labour. And along the bank of the river came small boy with his mother. Small boy rushed up and said, Oh, mister, do let me see you catch a fish. And his mother, running behind him, said, Now, don't you catch one for him till he says please. And a lot of people come under that sort of idea. We'd done... The, the levitation by electromagnetic induction of a three-foot diameter aluminium sphere in the Christmas lectures at the Royal Institution in 1966. Milbank Films wanted to make a film about induction and to include this. They told me they wanted it as the end shot so that they could put the captions over it as they went out of the film. Well, this thing took 450 amps from the mains at 415 volts if it was working normally. If it wasn't, it would blow the whole main circuit breaker out. But we'd done it at the RI, we'd killed that, we thought. So we set it up in the lab, and they were already right. Action, take, take one. Barry Owen and I put the sphere in and let go. And instead of just sitting there, as he had at the RI, it began to rock like this, rolling around more and more until I knew what was going to happen next it was going to go right over and it did and it went faster and faster and I knew that its target was now 3000 rpm well an aluminium sphere three foot diameter weighing about 40 50 pounds doing 3000 rpm is no thing to get in the way of and I could see Barry's face and he was thinking the same as I was that thing is not going to stop till it gets to 3000 and who then is going to stop it Worst of all, if the fuse blows, or if we switch it off, it'll just drop, and then it'll take off. So best we stop it now. So when we had got to about 600 RPM or so, I just nodded to Barry, and we went in and caught it with our hands and sort of took it out. And, and the, you know, the director said, well, well, why did you do that? We hadn't got long enough to put the captions on. I said, well, we didn't fancy stopping it when it was going any faster. So it's all right, I'll have a retake. We said, look, the coils are smoking now. So we poured some liquid nitrogen on the coils and started again. And the next time we put it in, let it go, it did something quite different. It bounced. It went in, up, down, doink, doink. No, it came right out into my arms and caught it. You see, right, cut, start again. So we sat down and had some tea while we thought all we ought to do. We'd now done this experiment three times, given three different results. When we had some tea, the light dawned. It had been made as two hemispheres welded together around the equator. If we started with the equator horizontally, it was all quite happy. Now, in your time here, you've had many distinguished visitors, but before we get on to one very distinguished visitor, yeah. let, let's talk about this Polynesian girl that paid you a visit once. Oh, yes, this was the first month I was here. And uh, I had 
a secretary with a lot of experience. She reminds me of my present secretary a lot. She even had the same initials. And um, she told me what I should do and what I should not do. And in the first month, I had a lecture commitment in Birmingham. The following day, I returned to the college and realized that something had happened whilst I'd been away. You could divide the population right up the middle. Mostly it was a man-woman affair. If I passed a secretary in the college, she more or less snarled at me. Sort of thing. And if I passed a young lecturer, he would sort of look me up and down in absolute admiration. I thought, I don't know what's gone on while I've been away. I got to my office, my secretary said, Oh, you, you had a visitor yesterday. Um, there was a young lady, I would think, from Tahiti. You'd pull him a leg. No, she said that this was the day before miniskirts. This one had the shortest skirt that had been seen at that time and a low-cut neck and back that practically met the short skirt. And she was of Polynesian extraction and she was suntanned and she wore coral beads and everything that a Tahitian girl should have. She was a dusky maiden, no less. She apparently had arrived whilst I was in Birmingham the day before and said she was going to see me and pretended she had an appointment to see me. My secretary said, well, he's not coming back today. He's in Birmingham. It's no good you're sitting there. She demanded to know someone in higher authority. And she was last taken to the awful, I mean it in the strict sense of the word, full of awe, the awful level six of this building where all the best people live. There she got as far as Sue Willis's secretary, unfortunately, <laughs> and said she wasn't going until I came. And eventually, after several hours, it dawned on that perhaps my secretary had been right and I wasn't coming back. And she went, and she never returned. And we never found out who she was. But there was a tale piece where I wouldn't be telling the story. About a week later, my secretary said to me, Thinking about that uh, dusky maiden, you know, she said, I had an idea. The day you were in Birmingham, the BBC put out a programme that you'd recorded some time earlier. It went out the night before she arrived. And I've just remembered that the last thing that was said by the interviewer was to camera, and he said, and Professor Lathwood is now experimenting at Imperial College with models. She was a model, and she'd come to be experimented with. And I've always regretted I was in Birmingham that day. <laughs> but it did no end of good, because, as I said, the younger end thought, what's he got that we have, and he can bring this sort of visitor to the college? It wasn't the usual thing in a man's world, no. Oh, well, someone you did have uh, not so long ago as a visitor was uh, Prince Charles. Tell us about that visit. Well, Prince Charles came at his own request. He'd seen the Christmas lectures at the Royal Institution in 1974. And my wife and I were invited to a party at Buckingham Palace beginning at 10 o'clock in the evening. It was an amazing party by any standards. There were about 500 people there. And you knew about 490 of them by sight. They were all in showbiz, mostly so. Or racing drivers, or all in wrestlers, or people like this. And you saw the most amazing combination of people. I remember seeing Sir Harold Macmillan talking to Ernie Wise, sitting on a chaise long, and you said, this is impossible, we're not here. <laughs> He's dreaming. And we stayed until 2 o'clock in the morning, and nobody seemed to be going to bed, and I was sure we were dreaming. But uh, eventually, we thought, ah, we see what you have to do. You go to the royal person you think has invited you. And I'd assumed it was Prince Philip because I'd been on his committee for six years in the 60s. And I said, couldn't it be the Prince of Wales that invited you? I said, George, it could do. So we went and stood in an obvious place and he came over to us because he'd said when we arrived at the party that he'd love the Christmas lectures and would I be doing any more sometime? And I said, I hope so. And he said he'd love to come. So at the end of the evening, I said to him, if we may return to the conversation we started earlier, um, was it the gyroscopes that interested your Royal Highness? He said, of course. I said, then if you want to see the gyroscope experiments, you don't have to wait for me giving a public lecture. I mean, you just come. He said, great, how about March the 6th? And the date was then February the 11th. And I thought, well, now I know I'm dreaming, because he can't make appointments like that without his diary and his secretary with him. Unless, my God, unless, you know, I'd have done something terribly wrong if I'd not asked him, which I would. 
because he had the date already. He said, all right, about three o'clock in the afternoon. And so it was that he came and saw the gyroscopes. Now, the authorities, meanwhile, I had to go and tell the authorities. Um, in particular, we'd just got our new rector. Uh, Lord Penny had retired, and Sir Brian Flowers, he was then, just taken take up the rectorship. And so I had to go and see him almost the first week he was here and tell him that the Prince of Wales was paying an unofficial visit. And he said... Um, Yes, well, there is a precedent for this sort of thing. Uh, Princess Margaret once uh, arranged to come uh, at short notice, and we had an emergency meeting of the Board of Governors, and we entertained at lunch, and I said, Rector, stop. I, I don't want you to think I'm telling you how to run your business, and it wasn't my idea that he should come. He invited himself, as it were. I said, but uh, with the best will in the world, he doesn't want to meet the Rector or the governing body. And he, he just wants to come and see the experiments and go, because I think it's his afternoon off. But by all means, you know, find out. Uh, he said, I'll have the secretary ring the palace. And the palace said, no, he doesn't want to meet the governing body, he just wants to come. So it was a highly top secret thing, because if the students had got to know, they'd have had their closed circuit television going, they'd have had all the lights and the razzmatazz. So I kept him with his back to the second year lab that was being run, and no student recognised him from the back, it was fantastic. I was also told from on high that I wasn't to ask him to manipulate the 50-pound wheel which you can lift above your head if you know how, with one hand, or almost on your little finger. So I showed him this, and he was terribly excited about it, and he said, I said, now I've been strictly impressed, and it's impressed on me, I'm not to ask your Royal Highness this, but off the record, would you, would you like to feel the uh, force for yourself? And he said, of course. I said, it'll take me about a quarter of an hour to teach you. It did, in fact, only take five minutes because he's as quick as his father on the uptake. And after five minutes, he was lifting the 50-pound wheel above his head and excited, and he said, what will you do next? I said, well, I'd thought of making a rowing boat that would row across the serpentine with oars that didn't touch the water, meaning they'd have wheels on the end instead. He said, promise me you won't do it until I can be there. I said, I promise. In fact, he said, if you can make it a two-seater, I'd love to row with you. And then if you sink, we both sink. And in 1975, as Eric Morgan would say, I really needed that. No, sorry, Ken Dodd. I really needed that because I was getting an awful lot of stick from the establishment for dabbling in a subject that wasn't mine. It was mine because it, the equations are the same as they are electromagnetism, and that's why it is my subject. And Michael Faraday taught me how to do it. So... Um, he left. We made him a, a presentation model of a gyro that he admired very much, and Colin Jones, the head of the workshop, presented it to him personally. And um, he left. Now, we've corresponded since, and the uh, allegiance still stands that when I make the first demonstration of the fact that the laws of motion need updating, I shall be having the Prince of Wales see it before anyone else, because I've promised him. Um, you've been talking now for something like 20 minutes. How would you, in another few minutes perhaps, sum up your work here at Imperial College? I know it's very difficult to... No, it's very simple really. I'm like a child who's been brought up inside an institution and has never seen the outside world, the sea, or trees in a wood and so on and I've been coming here was like being taken out of that box and put into the marvellous real world that there is and I've simply been standing and gazing in wonder at all the things that there are in the universe and I'd just like to live to be 200 because one lifetime isn't enough um, of course, I shall never retire. I mean, when I'm 65, I hope they'll make me Professor Emeritus, but I also hope they'll let me go on working. Um, yes, I'm writing a book on engineering and biology, and the last chapter is called Gaze in Wonder. And that's how I can sum it up. Thank you.